Hello, everyone, and welcome to Food Tank's webinar series. This is Sarah Small. I'm Food Tank's Global Events Director, and I'm really excited about today's webinar with Joel Berg. Uh, Joel is an author and active leader in the anti-hunger movement in America. He's also the executive director of the New York uh, City Coalition Against Hunger and a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. He's also the author of All You Can Eat, How Hungry is America, the definitive and most well-reviewed book on American hunger in the last decade. So today, his presentation will tell the story of hunger and food insecurity in the United States. Uh, and this webinar will be recorded and posted on foodtank.com afterwards. You can also follow along and participate using hashtag uh, foodtank on Twitter. And please submit your questions using the chat box in your control panel, or you can email them to me, sarah at foodtank.com. So without further ado, Joel, it's wonderful to have you here today, and I'm excited to hear your presentation. I will give you the floor now. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you, Food Tank, and thank you for those uh, tuning in now or watch a future recording of, of, of this. I have good news and bad news. The bad news is that hunger is vast, it's growing, it's morally reprehensible, and it's a drain on our entire economy. And even though the U.S. has less severe hunger and food insecurity than the developing world, it is still massive here. That's the bad news. The good news is we can solve it. History proves that we can solve it. In the next half hour or so, I'll explain how. So just a few numbers to start off with. Food insecurity and hunger now ravage one in six Americans and one in five U.S. children. That equals 49 million Americans and 16 million American children now live in food insecure homes. So take the population of California and combine it with another big state and you're still less than the number of people food insecure in America. Now, food insecurity is a wonkish term. It's a clunky term. I could never quite explain it to my late mother. She thought it was food safety or, 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 or something else. But the, the truth of the matter is it's a proper term to explain hunger in the American context. Because we have some safety net programs like school lunch and school breakfast and summer meals and the SNAP program and some, albeit minimal, minimum wages, because we have some of that, we don't have the kind of third world style levels of starvation that we used to in, in America. So things in America are better than Somalia better than North Korea, better than parts of Latin America. We don't have mass numbers of people starving in the streets like you might see in India. What food insecurity denotes is hunger and food shortages in the American context. And that means people choosing between food and rent. It means people rationing food and getting less healthy food. Ironically, uh, often adding a risk factor for obesity because they can't afford the healthier food. So hunger and obesity are sometimes flip sides of the same malnutrition coin. It means children going through the dumpster in front of their school to get breakfast. It means parents going without food to feed their children. It means people choosing between cancer medicine and, and food. And we are a country with so many billionaires that merely having a billion dollars is not enough to get you on the Forbes 400 list of the 400 wealthiest Americans. And by the way, the combined net worth of those billionaires is now more than $2.2 trillion. And the entire U.S. budget deficit is about, uh, about uh, five or $600 billion. So I'll talk a little bit more about inequality of wealth. So to put those 49 million food insecure Americans in context, you know, those, those uh, 400 billionaires have a combined net worth equals about three or four times the entire U.S. budget deficit. So, uh, you know, we don't compare our military to Somalia and North Korea. We don't compare our Olympic teams to, uh, you know, in, in India or Honduras. We shouldn't compare comparing our hunger and food insecurity and saying that things are just hunky-dory here because it's better than the developing world. Now, first an ad, we run the uh, New York City Coalition Against Hunger runs the USDA National Hunger Hotline. If you please, if you know anyone who needs food or any social service agencies that know people who might need food, please, please, please give out this number. That's 1-866-3-HUNGRY, 1-877-8-HOMBRE, H-A-M-B-R-E, 
M-B-R-E. Uh, and we have uh, live people who will answer calls in English and Spanish from Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. to let people know where they can get food near them, both pantries and kitchens run by private entities, as well as how to access SNAP, the new name for food stamps, benefits, WIC, etc. And I, I, I point out that this is a distinct project of the New York City Coalition Against Hunger. It is distinct from our advocacy and policy agenda. So anything I'm about to say in the rest of the webinar that relates to policy and, and, and you know, advocacy has, has nothing to do with this USDA grant or USDA uh, project. Now here's a map. It's, it's a bunch of years old now from 2006. Uh, the numbers have worsened, so I didn't want you to look at this particularly for since 2006, the numbers have worsened. So I don't think the most important thing is to focus on the level of it, but just to know that uh, even in the least hungry states in the union, even before the recession, even places like Minnesota and, and New Hampshire, that were the least hungry states in the union, that still meant in those states, one in 20 people lived in households that can't afford enough food. Now, I, I don't have an equivalent chart uh, for Canada, but the fact of the matter is the hungriest provinces in Canada, the provinces in Canada with the highest rates of food insecurity actually have far less food insecurity than the least hungry states in the United States. So to put that another way, the hungriest states in the United States are far hungrier, I'm sorry, the least hungry states in the United States, the best fed states in the United States have far higher levels of hunger than the hungriest, most food insecure provinces of, of Canada. This is not an inevitable part of human existence, as I will turn to over and over and over again in webinar. This is about decisions made by policymakers, decisions made by business leaders. And thus, the main causes of hunger in the United States are low wages and limited income, not laziness or drug addiction. The majority of food insecure adults work full-time or part-time. As for SNAP food stamps recipients, 80%, 80% of the able-bodied adults on the SNAP program were receiving, were working before, the year before and the year after starting to get SNAP. 80% of the healthy, able-bodied people on SNAP Adults were working the year before or the year getting after getting SNAP. And before the recession, the average length of time on SNAP was about six months. Now it's about eight months. This idea that it's this never-ending lifestyle for millions and millions is uh, just wrong. And by the way, half the Americans, half the people in America at some point will need and use SNAP benefits. It's not them versus us. The them is the us. I'll give you an example, a gentleman who's an activist with us on our Food Action Board project where we try to recruit low-income people to fight for policies on their behalf. Uh, Jose Gutierrez is an incredible man. He's a busboy and he's also a PTA president, very active in this community, but he supports his wife and two children on $450 per week. And no shock, they can't always afford groceries. Now, a lot of yuppies will tell me, well, Joy, uh, boy, if, if he just got financial education, if more poor people got financial education, they do better. Or if, uh, boy, they just learned to grow their own food and cook it on their own, they wouldn't have this problem. No offense, but that's just preposterously class biased and uh, absurd. If, if your rent is almost as expensive as your wages, all the financial education in the world is going to help you be hungry. And as you see, they are cooking a meal here. Shara Strength did a study, and 80% of low-income uh, households cook four more meals at home a, a, a year, uh, a week. Four more meals at home a week. And the stereotype of low-income people are eating all this fast food, well, while low-income people are only getting by on SNAP benefits, and you can't legally use SNAP benefits at fast food places in most cases. So low-income people are cooking at home. They do have financial education. They're just not paid enough to feed their families. America now has a higher level of inequality of wealth than Mexico or Sri Lanka. That's why we have hunger, because people who own businesses aren't paying their workers enough, not because they're not working hard enough. Now look at this chart. 
The red chart is the number of people food insecure or hungry in America. The green chart is the net worth of the Forbes for 100 Americans. And you've seen since the end of the recession, you know, hunger's leveled off a bit, but it hasn't gone down. This is the first major time that there hasn't been, in modern American history, the first major time there's not been a major reduction or hunger in hunger or poverty after the recession ended. And I want to be clear, I'm not bashing billionaires. I still believe that I'm a centrist and that the top way to reduce poverty in America is private sector job growth, living wage jobs. I do believe that if you work hard and play by the rules, you should get ahead. But for goodness sakes, you know, the opportunity capitalism that allowed my grandparents and come here and built a better world for themselves really has been replaced by crony capitalism. And the fact that we have 49 million Americans who can't afford enough food, when there's so many billionaires, you can have a billion dollars and still not be one of the 400 wealthiest Americans, is morally obscene and economically bankrupt. Hungry workers can't work. Hungry seniors can't stay independent, and hungry children can't learn. Because of that, hunger in America costs our economy more than $167 billion a year. Billion dollars per year. There's no way we can fix public education unless we first end child hunger. To be schooled, you must be fueled. To be well-read, you must be well-fed. I hope you enjoyed my Dr. Seuss moment uh, there. There's piles and piles and piles of evidence that there is no way we can fix public education unless we first ensure every kid is properly nourished. In fact, in order to achieve every major national goal in the country, restoring the middle class, cutting crime and incarceration, reducing health care spending, protecting the country from our enemies and slashing poverty, we must first end hunger. Two other points. The National School Lunch Program was first created as a national defense program in the 1940s because generals came to President Truman and said, our boys are too hungry to fight. Today, one of the top reasons soldiers are rejected for possible induction into the military is that they are overweight, which again is tied to poverty, tied to food insecurity. Not always, there are some very wealthy overweight people and many middle class overweight people, but no question there are additional risk factors. And just one other point on the economy. Nobel Prize winner Robert Fogel, Fogel, he was an economist who recently passed away, his research focused on the improvement in economics for average people during the Industrial Revolution in Europe. And what Fogel found, yes, technology was important, but one of the prime reasons workers were more productive during that time period was the increased food insecurity, the increased nutritional status of workers. There's no question that if you forget about all the moral reasons for ending hunger and food insecurity, and just of the economic self-interest, you have to understand that getting workers good nutrition is key to that. No superpower in the history of the world has remained a superpower without adequately feeding its own people. To remain a superpower, the U.S. simply must end hunger and food insecurity. As I said from the outset, history proves that we can end U.S. hunger if we simply return to doing what works. Look, Americans used to think that mass diseases like cholera, yellow fever, and malaria were inevitable and unstoppable. You know, malaria hurt more soldiers in the Civil War than bullets did. Yellow fever was such a deadly killer at points, places like New Orleans and the budding Washington, D.C., and Philadelphia during the Constitutional Convention had to be evacuated because of the yellow fever epidemics. Cholera is an even better example. Cholera was so rampant in big cities. In one year in the 1840s in New York City, there were so many people so many people suffering from cholera that if you transpose the people suffering from cholera to the population of New York City today, that would be 100,000 people per year in New York City alone dying from cholera. And people just assume, so, oh, cholera, yellow fever, malaria, there's nothing you can do about them. They're just a permanent part of the natural environment. The reason poor people are suffering from them more, there's something wrong with low-income people. They're dirty. They're smelly. They're too non-Protestant. They have too many kids. They drink too much. So that's why poor people are suffering from these diseases. And by the way, just as today, the elites 
blame low-income people for their poverty and hunger. And if you transpose it today, they're no longer dirty or smelly. They don't grow all their own food in their own garden in their backyard by scratch and cooking things very, very slowly. And that's why they're poor. Even though low-income people have two or three jobs they're already cooking, the assumption by many, many foodies, frankly, is that the reason people have these nutritional problems is they're just shopping badly and they're, they're just not cooking their own food. The same sort of false assumption of why low-income people were suffering from disease. And by the way, people believed that uh, sometimes God was punishing poor people for their bad behavior. And people believed that because you couldn't actually solve these diseases, because human beings couldn't solve these diseases, the most we could rely on is a little charity. And nuns could wipe your brow as you suffered from an inevitable death. But guess what? Government-led mosquito eradication efforts ended yellow fever and malaria, and government-led public health measures, most notably municipal water systems, wiped out cholera and other major diseases. City after city, town after town, county after county built municipal water systems. Now, municipal sounds a lot better than that evil, horrible, curse word government, but that's what they were. There's no way that the private sector or the nonprofit sector could have built municipal water systems. Only government could. And let me show you specifically what happens in New York City. Because I'm a kind, a fun kind of guy. Uh, maybe not. Uh, the Daily Show once dubbed me uh, Mr. Frowny Pants. But uh, I am a fun kind of guy. My light reading at night is charts like this from the New York City Department of Health titled Con Conquest of Pestilence for New York City. And you can see, look at the chart, cholera spiking, cholera spiking, mass, mass, mass cholera. And you can barely see it, but underneath that little cloud-looking thing that says 1866 Board of Health, Health Development Established, you can see below that 1842, Croton Reservoir opened and municipal water came in and clean water came in. And you will see almost immediately Almost immediately after New York City had a government-led system of creating, of cleaning water for everyone, cholera in New York City went away. And we haven't basically had serious cholera in New York City or in America for 100 years. And my point of this whole talk is if we can solve these big diseases through government intervention with the help of the for-profit and non-profit sectors, but primarily led by the people we elect to solve big problems for us, we can end hunger. Americans still think hunger is inevitable and solvable, but history proves that this problem is, is not only fixable, but we know exactly how to solve it. We know how to end hunger because we almost did it once. In the late 60s, teams of doctors found pockets of third world style malnutrition in low income communities nationwide, places like the Mississippi Delta, Native American reservations in the Great Plains. Latino areas along the great uh, Texas-Mexico border, inner cities like Harlem and Bed-Stuy and, and Watts and the south side of Chicago, and white rural areas such as Appalachia. These studies generated massive media coverage. They generated fodder for Dr. King's Poor People's Movement, and one of the top demands of the Poor People's Movement was the creation of the modern nutrition assistance safety net. And so what happens in response to this media coverage, in response to this grassroots organizing, bipartisan coalitions in Congress and in the White House, President Nixon, President Carter, some very conservative Republicans like Robert Dole of Kansas in the Senate teamed up with very liberal Democrats like George McGovern. And they created the modern food safety net, the modern nutrition safety net. Before this time, food stamps were basically a small discount coupon program. The WIC program didn't exist until President Nixon created a forerunner of the WIC program uh, by signing it in an executive order. And there was a school lunch program, but it wasn't that widely used. It, was, uh, it wasn't used in some of the poorest, non-whitest communities, and school breakfast programs didn't exist. So because of changes in the law, these programs skyrocketed in their participation. So just from 1969 to 1979, you see that the number of people getting what was then called food stamps, now called SNAP, went up from a little over 2 million to about 18 million. Number of kids getting school lunches went from a little under 4 million to nearly 12 million. Number of kids getting school breakfast basically didn't exist. 
went up to a few million. The WIC program didn't exist, started serving a few million people, and summer meals for kids over the summer didn't exist, started feeding a few million people. Federal government also actively supported efforts to create jobs and raise wages. The minimum wage was a far higher percentage of actually living costs in the 70s than it is today. Guess what? These federal efforts worked. I know it's fashionable today to say that government would mess up a two-car parade, that government can't do anything right, but just as government eliminated cholera in America, government-led efforts almost entirely eliminated hunger in, in America. Now, it wasn't just the government programs on its own. We had a better economy then. It was a more inclusive economy. It was a more unionized economy that ensured that more jobs paid a living wage, but that combined with the federal safety net almost entirely ended hunger in America. How do we know? Because doctors went back to the same places and found a massive reduction in hunger and concluded that the government programs, quote, made the difference, end quote. Let me repeat that. Because of higher wages, more jobs, and a more serious anti-poverty, anti-hunger safety net, we almost entirely ended hunger in the 1970s. If you are hungry in the 1970s, you are almost certainly unemployed or partially employed. This idea that you could be working full time, have one or two or three jobs, and not be able to earn enough money to feed your family, that was just not the reality in the 70s and is the reality today. So given that U.S. almost ended hunger entirely in the 1970s, why do 49 million Americans and 16 million American children suffer from it now? Because of the bucket brigade mentality. I know many of you were waiting for this exciting bucket brigade section of the talk, but now you're here. Look, we used to fight fires in America with bucket brigades. One bucket at a time, one bucket at a time, one bucket at a time. Someone would yell out, fire! And if the men in the town, it was almost always men, if they weren't too sick from yellow fever, cholera, and malaria, and sometimes people were too sick from those diseases uh, to man the bucket brigades. When I was researching my book and I found the connection between cholera and the bucket brigades, I said, oh my goodness, all my stories connect. But people would go to the well, and if they didn't run out of water, if uh, it didn't freeze, if they had enough people, uh, and not everyone would show up at 3 a.m. in February to do this, but if everything worked, they deliver about 60 gallons of water a minute. Look at those happy people on the fire brigade. It made us feel great. You didn't need a big government bureaucracy to do a bucket brigade. You didn't need big taxpayer dollars. It was just citizens banding together, the faith-based armies of compassion of their time. There's only one weensy, teensy little problem with the bucket brigades. The bucket brigades didn't work. They didn't stop fires. City after city burnt to a crisp. Don't believe me? Big fire in New York, Manhattan, 1776. Manhattan was ashes within days. Chicago, 1871. We don't know whether it's true that Mrs. O'Leary's cow really knocked over a lantern to start the fire, but we do know that Chicago was nothing but ashes within days. San Francisco, 1906, big earthquake, but it wasn't the earthquake that totally destroyed the city. It was the fire that followed the earthquake. But government solved this problem in big cities by replacing volunteers in buckets with professional paid full-time departments with modern firefighting equipment. A modern fire truck delivers 1,000 gallons of water a minute. A thousand gallons of water a minute. Now, if you are in your home and you're on your third floor, you're with all your, your prized possessions, uh, your cats, your family photos, uh, a copy of my book, and your family's a threat from a fire, which would you prefer? A volunteer bucket brigade that may or may not show up, but if it does show up, can deliver 60 gallons of water a minute or a professional firefighting department that can deliver a thousand gallons of water a minute and is guaranteed to be there within minutes because your tax dollars paid for them to be there. Often I give this talk in person and I ask people to raise their hand if when it comes to their own family, they prefer the bucket brigades. Not once, not once has anyone in even some of the most conservative states in the union suggested that when it comes to their own health and safety, should they prefer volunteer charity to help them? So if it comes to 
something as important as your own health and safety, you rely on a government provided service like a fire department. Why don't we understand that when it comes to something as important as feeding 49 million of our neighbors, we need to rely on a guaranteed government program. Understand food drives are the bucket brigades of today. One can at a time, one can at a time, one can at a time. Look, there's the fire bucket and there's the can. And just as the bucket brigades fail to end fires, food drives and food banks, as wonderful and important as they are, are failing to end hunger. Every year, more and more Americans are going to soup kitchens and food pantries, and every year, more Americans are going hungry. So if the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again the same way and expecting a different result, the definition of insanity is thinking we can end hunger through more canned food drives. Telling people they can end hunger with canned food drives is like telling them they can fill the Grand Canyon with a teaspoon. And I said this at a talk once and some joker got up and said, aha, you could fill the Grand Canyon with this teaspoon if you had enough time. And I said, no, you couldn't because the Grand Canyon would erode faster than you would fill it. And that's what's exactly what's happening with the food drives and food banks and soup kitchens. Now I wanna make crystal clear that the people running these programs, food banks, and particularly soup kitchens and food pantries that are unpaid volunteers, most of them, and they've been doing this for decades, sometimes taking money out of their own pocket to feed their neighbors, are among the best people on the planet. They're doing vital work and they're filling in vital gaps. So I don't say they should go away immediately. And I want to thank and honor the people doing this work. Many of them are religious people who are really putting their religion into action. So this is not critique of the people. This is not a critique of the agencies. This is a critique of the system and the long-term system isn't working. To make matters even worse, massive cuts in nutrition programs enacted by the Congress and the president dwarf the food distributed by charities. Just look at this chart. Every morsel of food distributed by every soup kitchen, food bank, food pantry, and food rescue group in America, by my estimate, is about $5 billion worth of food. Yet a few years ago, to pass the child nutrition bill, Congress cut $5 billion. And as part of the farm bill, they cut another $8.6 billion in SNAP. So you add that together, get about 13, almost $14 billion worth of cuts so in other words, the money taken out of the SNAP program by Congress with the agreement of this president, unfortunately, equals three times the amount of food distributed by every charity in America. But you can fight back and you can build a movement to end hunger in America. One way to do it is to volunteer. We've launched a nationwide Ending Hunger Through Citizen Service initiative to enable Americans of all ages and backgrounds to volunteer more strategically. We provide concrete ways that people can use their skills as designers, lawyers, coders, writers, accountants, community activists, strategic planners, fundraisers, and videographers to make an even bigger difference in the fight. Go to hungervolunteer.org to learn how to volunteer more effectively or shoot me an email or Amanda on our staff who handles volunteers and we will hook you up either in New York or anywhere around the country with more effective volunteer activities. But the most important thing we need to do is to change public policies in order to create jobs, raise wages, and boost the food safety net. Now, some ask me how they can end hunger without influencing public policy. Honestly, that's like asking how we can end drought without water. You just can't do it. Now, people say this is too tough to do. That's a cop out. It's not too tough to do. I'll talk a little in the end about some things that were tough and how this isn't really tough. I could go into this more in the questions and answers, but I have a basic six steps plan that can entirely end all U.S. hunger in just a few years. One, create millions of U.S. jobs. Raising wages, increasing the minimum wage isn't good enough if not enough jobs exist. So create millions of new U.S. jobs. How to do that? Have tax incentives that really focus on job creation, but also have government job creation programs focused on things we really need, like updating our infrastructure, which is crumbling, like ensuring that we have more jobs in green infrastructure and saving energy. Create millions of U.S. jobs. Ensure let all U.S. jobs pay a living wage. My old boss, Bill Clinton, used to say, people who work hard and play by the rules shouldn't be poor, and they certainly shouldn't be paid be hungry. 
For hunger safety net programs like SNAP, SNAP and WIC, slash paperwork and use the savings to increase benefits to enable all low-income Americans to afford sufficient, healthy food. I wrote about this in mind-numbing, wonkish detail in my book. I also wrote a paper for this for the Center for American Progress that you can get online that says, uh, Doing What Works, Ending Hunger. And basically, even though there are great groups like Single Stop, USA and the Benefit Bank, in most places, in most ways, people applying for multiple benefits have to go to multiple offices, submit multiple applications, have multiple follow-up interviews, going through a mind-numbingly complex bureaucracy that's very complex. Sometimes liberals like it because they think poor people can't possibly get these benefits without their help, and, and sometimes groups get lots of money to do this benefits outreach, as does my group, but I gladly give up that benefit outreach grant money if it was just easier for poor people to get these benefits, and sometimes conservatives like it because it makes it tougher for poor people to get food. Just eliminate that vast bureaucracy and let everyone to get it on their smartphone or when they file their earned income tax credit and just use those billions of dollars saved on bureaucracy to get more people food. Four, provide all children universal free school breakfast, lunch, and summer meals. Let's stop divvying up the free meals versus the low cost meals versus the full price meals. The amount of paperwork students and teachers and school districts has to fill out cost the system billions of dollars. You could save billions of dollars by just giving every kid a nutritious, good meal. Fully fund Meals on Wheels and Senior Center Meals programs, that should be a no-brainer. The people who have given all to our society, raised our children, fought our wars, built our economy, certainly shouldn't be hungry. Yes, we should expand community gardens and urban farms. Sorry, I spelled urban wrong. Farmers markets and CSAs to supplement but not replace steps one through five. Some of you may be foodies, and every one of my talks, some foodie gets up and says, oh, we could just end this problem if everyone grew their own food. Well, that's not a solution in Southern Florida or Southern California where it's a 12-month growing season. There's no place in the country you can grow everything you need. It's ridiculously time-intensive. Most poor people don't have land, and particularly in the rest of the country where you're going to harvest food for maybe 12 weeks out of the year. I like eating for 52 weeks out of the year, not only 12 weeks. So this is all important at the edges, but please do not ever think that that can be a substitute for living wage jobs more jobs and an adequate safety net. History proves that doing those things would wipe out hunger in the US. And doing those things would cost the country far, far less than the $160 billion we lose annually because of hunger. To get that done, we will need to build a political movement to force our elected officials to take action. As the women's civil rights and marriage equity movements have proven, nothing is more powerful than people power. Now let me say, you're gonna say, oh, our elected officials don't answer. That's just not true. That's a cop-out. And you say, oh, it's too hard. Well, I can't prove that political advocacy is going to end hunger. I can prove the status quo of just relying on charity will not. This is our only hope. Now, crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma while getting the crap beat out of you because you merely wanted the right to vote, that was hard. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton chaining themselves to a voting booth and going to prison to support women's voting rights. That was hard. That was hard. Landing at a beach in Normandy under withering machine gun and mortifier. That was hard. Taking five minutes to email or call or meet with your elected officials. That's easy. And anything less than that is a cop out. Civilized, successful nations end hunger. Civilized, successful nation ensure that all adults and seniors have enough food. Look, we were told that slavery was inevitable. We were told that child labor, labor was inevitable. We were told there's nothing you can do about, nothing will change. We were told there's no way the country will ever allow same-sex people to get married. But in each of those cases, people said, no, that's unacceptable. We're not going to accept slavery. We're not going to accept child labor. We're not going to accept gay and lesbian transgender people being declared half human. We're going to build the movements necessary to demand that we have this justice. And the time is now to build the movement to demand that all Americans have plentiful access to nutritious food. Thank you. That's my uh, rant. And now I'll take uh, questions. That's my plea to join us in the movement and what a happy little girl looks like when she's eating a delicious apple.
Thank you, Joel. That was great and a really informative presentation. And hopefully people are feeling uh, engaged and inspired now. Uh, so we do have a lot of questions from listeners, but I'd like to also remind our audience to continue to send them in using the chat box, emailing sarah at foodtank.com or sending them via Twitter with hashtag food tank. So for the next uh, 10 minutes or so, let's get through as many as possible. Uh, and this first question, I, I think you did a really great job of, of, of taking the broad view of, of hunger in the US, but I think it's getting down to a more uh, local level. So it reads, how does the work of the New York uh, City Coalition Against Hunger work towards building a stronger, more resilient food system in the US that will eliminate hunger? Well, I think the first thing we are doing is building a political movement. And one thing I didn't emphasize enough in my talk, we cannot do this without low-income hungry Americans, food insecure Americans being the forefront of that movement. No social movement in the history of the world has been won by one people on behalf of another. If women were just waiting for men to just wake up and give them the right to vote, uh, women still wouldn't be voting. So we have a thing in New York City called Food Action Boards, where we recruit people who go to pantries and kitchens. We have a whole curriculum about civic engagement. We learn for them, they learn for us, and we teach people to a lobby, we teach people to do interviews, we teach people to testify, and it totally changes the conversation. When I go in a congressperson's office and say, you shouldn't let someone go hungry, they go, oh yeah, yeah that's too bad, y'all. But when a, a, a parent says, you cannot cut this program and let my kids go hungry, it has five times more powerful impact. Impact. So that's just one of the things we're, we're, we're doing, and I'd urge other people to go to our website to see more. Great. Thank you, Joel. Uh, the next question reads, what research can scholars and students be working on to support these initiatives? Well, I, I, I think uh, there can be more research on, on, on that we... Uh, really do have effective programs. I think people need to understand a little more about how low the rate of fraud is, how low, how effective school meals programs are. Although I, I caution to, even though my organization does research and we use it and we work closely with researchers, to also not give anyone the impression we don't know what works and we have to do a lot of research to find the solution. We, we have the solution and it's, it's part of the opposition's job, the right wing who wants to basically just keep wages low and not have a safety net to, to create this false doubt that we don't know that what works. So Dr. King used to cite the, the paralysis of analysis. So I think we do need you know, uh, more good data, but I think that shouldn't deter us from today doing what we need to do to build the political movement to do what already works. Great. Thanks again, Joel. Uh, and the next two questions I, I'll group together. They're, they're related. So the first one reads, uh, why don't we see more anti-hunger advocates aligning themselves with employment and wage issues? The second question is, what effect will raising minimum wage like in New York City have on ending hunger? Do you think this is a step in the right direction? I'd say increasingly hunger groups have been aligned. In the 14 years I've been with uh, our group, I've, I've aligned with those campaigns as much as possible, consistently paid supported unions and, and work to raise the minimum wage and uh, overall and, and uh, pass living wage laws. And more and more food banks are doing it. Uh, the Oregon Food Bank, the Food Bank of New York City, two very large and successful food banks were way out front in supporting minimum wage increases. But it is tough for other entities in the food business because some of the biggest donors, frankly, to anti-hunger work are some of the biggest opponents of wage increases, the, the restaurant industry and uh, the grocery industry. And I, I do respectfully challenge some of my colleagues in the movement that if these entities are represented on your board, they're great friends of yours, they're great donors of yours, you've been working with them for decades, then you should be able to have a conversation about them with wages. I think that the food banks that did do this did not find a reduction in, in, in uh, donations. So it's a myth that uh, food distribution organizations can't speak out about these issues. And the only way we're ever going to succeed is joining together as one big anti-poverty and workers movement. Hunger groups just don't have the resources to do it on our own. And I think it's very helpful to the minimum wage side of the equation to unions when we get out there and we forcefully say, if you want to end hunger, if you want to reduce reliance on SNAP, you know, support wage hikes. And I, I, every time I talk about this, I challenge conservatives. If I still haven't convinced you that SNAP's a great program, I probably never will. Uh, so uh, then the least you should do is support minimum wage increases. It won't cost the taxpayers a penny, and it could dramatically reduce the need for these programs. I, I, I do think a minimum wage hike in New York will help. Uh, we strongly support the effort to increase 
help for fast food workers, but we have pointed out, well, it's a little ridiculous, that the state of New York has actually continued a sub-minimum wage for tip workers. And, and, and so uh, it is going to be likely when this goes through that people working at an Applebee's will make far, far less money than people working at a McDonald's. And that just makes no sense. So we certainly support raising it for uh, fast food workers, but I think it makes more economic and political sense and all around sense and legal sense to just raise the wages for all workers. And it makes most sense to do it on a nationwide basis because we really are in a national economy. But I, I applaud states not waiting for Congress to act. Thanks again, Joel. Uh, the next question reads, how do you economically solve hunger by using healthy foods and not creating the overfed and malnourished situation that we tend to see when providing cheap and usually less healthy foods to the hungry? Well, I think the key is to understand that if you build it, they will come. This is not a question of low-income people not wanting healthier food, not knowing how to use it. We have a community-supported agriculture CSA project in New York City where we're bringing uh, healthy food from regional farmers, sustainably grown food, into low-income neighborhoods, and people are paying good money to use it. We subsidize it heavily, but low-income people know what's good for them. They just don't have access to it. So uh, rather than restricting or micromanaging the lives of low-income people or telling them what they can or cannot eat, a far better strategy is making healthier food more affordable, available, and convenient. I think it's a problem that some have sort of fetishized taking a long time to create your meal. That's all well and good. If you like cooking, that's all well and good. If you have time after your two or three jobs and then commute by public transportation. But I also think healthier food should be convenient, and convenient should not be synonymous with unhealthy. And should not and uh, healthy should not be synonymous with expensive. We need more private sector focus on bringing affordable, healthy, fast food into low-income neighborhoods. So I think we need to do all those things at once. Thanks, Joel. Uh, the next question is: There are at least three levels of government: uh, federal, state, and municipal slash city. Are there any examples in the U.S. Uh, or state or municipal governments blazing meaningful trails in spite of the challenge and inaction at the federal level? Uh, he comments, I'm thinking that a bottoms-up approach needs to happen too. Yes, but. Yes, but there are plenty of good things states have, have done. And for instance, Oregon had a very high level of food insecurity, and they had a number of governors who supported and worked with advocates in Oregon to really increase SNAP participation. And there was a statistically significant decrease in uh, SNAP. But keep in mind that virtually everything a state or locality can do is improve uh, you know, with the exception of raising wages, is in, when it comes to the hunger programs, is improve utilization of federal programs. And if the federal programs are diminished, there's nothing a state or locality can do. There are some things governors could do to ameliorate the last round of SNAP cuts, but in the end, the federal government took away $14 billion worth of food from low-income people. To put this in perspective, New York City uh, probably gets about $3 billion, $3 billion with a B, worth of SNAP benefits. The city of New York spends about 10 million on food pantries and, and soup kitchens and supplementing some other uh, uh, programs. So I know people are frustrated with Washington want to say, oh, if Washington doesn't work, let's just fix it on the state and local level. But I must respectfully suggest, you know, the vast majority of money spent on these programs is federal. The, uh, the economy is national. And so while a lot of people want to make stuff work more on a local level, and by all means you should, there can be no substitute for fixing our nation. Thanks, Joel. And, and uh, by the way, if you wiped out hunger in your community somehow miraculously, everyone would move there tomorrow. Uh, and the next two questions, uh, I, I'll once again uh, group together. So the first part is, um, how do you think food recovery or redirecting surplus food plays into food assistance programs? And the second one would be, so what role do food banks play in ending hunger versus for-profit entities with a social mission? Okay, two, two questions. I may ask you to remind me. The, the first is about food recovery and food rescue. Look, you know, food waste is a huge, huge, huge problem in, in America. You know, varying estimates up to a quarter, maybe a third of the food produced in America is uh, wasted. Uh, some of that food can better be recovered and fed to hungry people. But the main reason we should reduce food waste is the environmental impact, that uh, food is uh, the single greatest contributor to the solid waste stream. 
and some places are still incinerating food, not many places, many places are still landfilling, virtually everyone else is landfilling food. In New York City, landfills were so controversial and so harmful to the environment, we no longer even have landfills in New York City. Our garbage is shipped to uh, Pennsylvania two states away. Think of the energy and harm to the environment used to ship all this garbage of 8 million people two states away, not to mention the environmental impact on those poor people in a low-income rural area of Pennsylvania who needed the landfill in there. So food waste is horrible for the environment. And so uh, when I worked in USDA, we worked with the Department of, uh, with EPA to develop a protocol saying, if you can feed it to hungry people, feed it to hungry people. If you can't feed it to hungry people economically, feed it to animals. If you can't feed it to animals, compost it. And only as a last, last, last resort should we uh, have it let, end up in landfills. That being said, most of the food that's economical to recover has been recovered. A lot of that poundage is peels and packaging. So perhaps some of the statements about how much hunger could be reduced by this food waste are exaggerated. If the amount of food is small enough, then actually recovering it uh, will cost more than buying new food. So I know it goes against every fiber of our being not to recover every ounce of food, but sometimes it just doesn't make economic sense. And by and large, the most food wasted that can be safely recovered is at the farm level. And some people have suggested more tax credit to farmers. Farmers often do not pay taxes uh, for complicated reasons about how they do their, their accounting. So instead, I think we need a direct grant program to make at least sure that farmers don't lose money on the packaging and picking. Now, the role of food banks. I think that every food bank should be advocating Every food bank should be helping people access federal nutrition assistance benefits, and every food bank should be working to support job creation. Uh, but also uh, that for those, the continuum should go in the other way. For those for whom jobs aren't enough or community food security efforts aren't enough, there should be a safety net. And for those of whom the current safety net isn't enough, there should be food from food banks. So they are a safety net, sometimes for the least vulnerable people in society, but they should be supplementing the safety net. They should not be seen as the new American safety net. Again, the federal safety net, even as underutilized as it is, as slashed as it is, is about a hundred billion dollars. All the charity in America is about five billion dollars. So right now the federal government, even as inadequate as the federal response is, is 20 times what every charity in America is doing. Just pure math proves there is no way on the planet you can now charity in this. Now, uh, I work with many social entrepreneurs. I consider myself a social entrepreneur for a nonprofit group. Uh, I just think Sometimes we fetishize social entrepreneurship in, in America or think that technology, some sexy new app, is going to fix this problem. Uh, they can improve the problem, and I've been arguing that uh, benefits should be better accessed by uh, you know, smartphones and by the internet, and there's certainly a role for the tech industry to play in that. But make no mistake about it, nowhere in the world, nowhere in world history has a private entity no matter how well-meaning, no matter how socially conscious or nonprofit group solved a major social problem. The only people with the money, the only people with the scope, the only people with the legitimate democratic authority to solve major problems on behalf of the whole society are government. I know that goes against of what society says today, and even many progressive people discount the role of government. I think uh, Occupy Wall Street was actually secretly hijacked by the right because so many messages of the people were there, oh, government can't do it, government can't do it, and I respectfully say they've actually been, unbeknownst to them, brainwashed by the right. Government is not the end all or be all, but it, if the only way we can respond to national disasters is having FEMA come in, if we have a man-made disaster of hunger, we have to understand that the same rules apply. We have an interstate highway system, not financed by social entrepreneurs, but by government because it's in the national interest to solve this collectively. It's in the national interest to solve these problems collectively. And social enterprises can help at the edges and should help at the edges and should create models that government should be adopting, but they can't be seen as the long-term answer. Thanks, Joel. I think we could continue talking about this for, for many more hours. Uh, I think we have time for just one more question. Uh, and it, uh, brings it more down to the individual level. So the question reads, how, as ordinary citizens, can we help end hunger? If we can't end hunger with charity, then how are our do dollars best spent? What are some examples of volunteering more strategically? The first thing you can do is not go to the bathroom after getting off this webinar, is to pick up your phone and call 
202-224-3121. That's 202-224-3121. Ask for your senior United States Senator, ask for one of your United States Senator's office, and tell them they must immediately pass a child nutrition bill with significantly more funding to make school meals universal and the Women's Infants and Children program universal. Then put down the phone. And again, call 202-224-3121 and call your second United States Senator and do the same thing. Then put down the phone, make one third call to 202-224-3121 and call for your member of your House of Representatives. If you don't know who that is, you can find online by putting in your zip code or your address and find your member of the House of Representatives and tell them again that they must pass a child nutrition bill this year that provides extra funding to make sure every kid who needs school meals gets it and summer meals gets it and every kid and pregnant woman who needs WIC gets it. That's number one. Number two, you can go to our website, hungervolunteer.org, and find out about other ways other than advocacy. For instance, handing out flyers about summer meals, volunteering to help people access SNAP benefits are huge help. If you know how to design a web, helping your local soup kitchen or food pantry have a better web presence, really figuring out to use your professional skills to do it. And three, when you volunteer, not to make a self-interest push for the groups like the New York City Coalition Against Hunger, but I will make a self-interested push for groups like the New York City Coalition Against Hunger you should donate to groups that do advocacy, that groups have a message that you agree with. A lot of progressives understand that gay rights uh, and marriage equity is a political issue, that, uh, that global warming is a political issue, don't understand that hunger is, and they don't understand that advocates, we have uh, salaries to pay too, we have rents to pay too, they understand that food banks need donations. People often don't even understand that people like me, oh, by the way, I do get paid for a living, not a boatload, more than, you know, most Americans, but, you know, I got to pay for salary and my staff and our rent. So groups like ours do need uh, money and we need to send the message that we are among the most effective in, in getting the job done. Our advocacy helped ensure that a few hundred thousand kids in New York City are going to get school breakfast. So my last plug is go to our website, www.nyca.org, N-Y-C-C-H.org, and to donate to us. You know, uh, tweet about us and, 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 and go to... Facebook and do it. And there are many good advocacy groups in at least half the states in the United States and go to them and tell your friends, you know, continue giving to the food distribution, but really focus on as much as you can funding advocacy and true social change that will actually end this problem. Now, I've been spending a lot of time in the South and the Midwest, so I speak more slowly than I usually do on this webinar. So I hope I didn't speak too slowly for everyone, but thank you for listening. Thanks, Joel, and, and wow, what an informative presentation. And I'm thoroughly impressed by your memorization of those phone numbers, and I hope that our audience is inspired to pick up the phone and make those three calls after this webinar. Uh, so it was truly a pleasure to have you, and I really appreciate your time. And thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in and sending their questions for this interactive discussion. Uh, just as a reminder, this recording will be posted later today on foodtank.com. So thank you again to everyone and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.